Okay, thank you. Aloha. Welcome back. As Mike said, we have all the answers uh, in this panel, so stay tuned, get your notebooks out. Uh, the organizers did try to put some logic behind the first panel and the second panel, but uh, we didn't really spend a lot of time discussing scenarios uh, in the first panel, and we've told both of our speakers that essentially they can talk about whatever they want to talk about as long as it somehow ties to the alliances and, and challenges. Uh, I think there are a couple of uh, far-reaching questions. One question that we heard uh, in the first panel was, uh, while the U.S. may be the only country really still capable of leading, are we willing to lead? Are we prepared to lead? Uh, I think uh, we can uh, all reach our own conclusions on that. But the companion question is, is Japan prepared and willing to take a more active leadership role? Uh, and is the region prepared uh, for Japan to do so? Uh, and I hope we will look at that question during uh, this session. Uh, I think a companion question to that is whether the perception, at least, of, of many that Japan has been looking backwards uh, will impede its ability to move forward or to be accepted as a, as a leader. So I think these are questions that are useful to ask at the, at the macro level. Uh, at the micro level, I think there was a very specific question about what can we be doing, what should be we, we be doing in the South China Sea. Uh, there was uh, a comment by, I think, an over-exuberant U.S. admiral talking about Japanese P-3s patrolling in the South China Sea. I'm, I'm not sure that's really what we were looking for, but it'll be interesting to hear uh, both uh, speakers' views on that. And there were a few things that, that were that were not mentioned. Uh, I think the role of India in, in all of this really didn't, didn't come up, uh, but there has been, I think, a lot of efforts between the U.S. and Japan to involve Australia and India uh, in uh, greater involvement in uh, trilateral and, and quadrilateral cooperation. Uh, there's also one of my favorite topics, which is what's going on or what could be going on in Central Asia. Uh, at some point, Mr. Putin is going to be blocked from moving any further to the west uh, and then maybe start looking toward the south. Uh, here he's going to run into Chinese influences. And uh, does the U.S. and Japan have a role there, or do we just sit back and watch a new great game uh, evolve between Russia and China and, and wish them uh, both well? Uh, finally, I, I want to, first of all, commend uh, Japan for the... Uh, outstanding efforts that we've already seen by the Japanese government to try to provide support and stability in the Middle East uh, in response to the ISIS threat. Uh, also very much commiserate uh, with Japan for the uh, horrific uh, be, uh, treatment of two Japanese citizens. Uh, I question, or I would, would ask the question to, uh, at least to Nogami-san, uh, whether or not uh, this ISIS uh, incident uh, will cause Japanese people to be less willing to get involved overseas or whether it will provide a stimulant for them to become more involved uh, due to the outrage over those actions. So I think there are a lot of, a lot of topics and questions, uh, others that I'm sure you have on your mind. Uh, we didn't hear at all uh, about economic dimensions in any great degree. Uh, but I'm delighted that uh, Nogami-san has said that he will address during his remarks a TPP, since I think this has uh, security as well as economic uh, implications <laughs> and is one of the challenges we face. So at this point, let me turn it over to uh, Nogami-san for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ralph. Uh, the, uh, I'm actually very much disadvantaged because uh, I'm faced with those uh, detailed questions uh, for the first time right now, so uh, yeah, I, I'm not really sure whether I can respond to those questions. Uh, but uh, let me start by uh, uh, the, uh, uh, talking about more, more sort of uh, positive backdrops for the uh, Japanese, uh, you know, the uh, recent Japanese efforts to, to in increase our contribution. If I may use uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, the uh, 
well, a proactive uh, con contribution to peace in, on, on the basis of international cooperation. I think, uh, yeah, needless to say, uh, any, you know, the uh, politics is domestic, and uh, what is really crucial is domestic backdrop. The, uh, I think uh, there's a very positive, uh, I, would, I would say three positive uh, domestic backdrops for this uh, you know, positive uh, the uh, direction of uh, Japanese uh, you know, foreign security policy. That is the internal domestic stability uh, of Japan. The, uh, I think uh, compared to uh, uh, many of the uh, advanced uh, countries, uh, uh, I think at the moment, Japanese domestic political situation, I, I would say, is more stable than any other. Now, this is very crucial. <clears throat> the, uh, I, perhaps uh, in the, I do not have to overemphasize the importance of domestic political stability, uh, I think, the, in, in Washington, D.C. The, uh, uh, the, we do not see any political dysfunctioning at the moment. <clears throat> the, uh, and, and this situation will continue perhaps for the next four to five years. And this is a very important backdrop. The, uh, uh, the, for instance, a new security legislation, I think uh, Minister Komura was uh, very, very cautious and uh, very modest, but I think uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the new legislation will pass the, uh, uh, both houses, uh, the, perhaps by, by this, this, this summer. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, first, the approach is very cautious and also approach is incremental, and we are good at the incremental approach, although we have been very often criticized by our incremental approach, but uh, I think uh, on many issues, incremental approaches work. <coughs> uh, the second is uh, economic upturn. I think uh, for next year or two, we, our economic situation will look fairly positive. Uh, the, uh, the, we will not grow as fast as perhaps the United States, but nonetheless, uh, the, uh, uh, the three positive factors uh, are in play. Uh, the first, uh, income growth uh, the, through this uh, wage hikes. Uh, the, on the average, uh, I think uh, this year, the, uh, the, corp the workers for the large corporation will receive perhaps uh, nearly 3% real income in, uh, growth which would stimulate the economy. And oil price, of course, low oil price is a uh, 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 boon to our economy. And the exchange rate adjustment as a result of the, uh, the first arrow of economics, those will work very positively. So therefore, the, uh, the Japanese outlook, uh, economic outlook for this one year is perhaps very, very positive. So with these uh, three, uh, you know, backdrops, I think uh, the, there is a ground, there is a very uh, strong, solid basis for pursuing this proactive uh, uh, contribution to, this policy of uh, proactive contribution to peace. <coughs> now, of course, uh, you know, we're going to face a lot of uh, the uh, difficult uh, situation, for instance, uh, the situation in, 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 in the Middle East, the, uh, for instance, ISIS. But I'm not really sure whether in this, uh, the, the, uh, the first, uh, I'm talking about this, uh, you're addressing your question, the, uh, whether Japanese be would uh, become uh, uh, less uh, engaging in this you know, South East, in the, uh, situation in the Middle East. I, I, I don't think so. The, I, I doubt it. I think uh, this, uh, if you take a look at the press coverage, uh, you know, there is no, uh, uh, I haven't seen any press coverage over this uh, hostage issue for the next, uh, for the last uh, a month or so. Uh, it's gone now, it disappeared. Uh, the, on, on top of that, the Prime Minister increased humanitarian assistance uh, to uh, Jordan only uh, in a few weeks ago after this uh, crisis situation, and uh, there was no criticism at all. At one stage, uh, some, uh, you know, the uh, parliamentary members raised this point in the parliamentary debate, but uh, you know, they, I think that was completely discarded. So, uh, uh, no problem. 
the, uh, uh, the one, uh, uh, another question you raised, uh, you know, is Japan ready for leadership? I, I think uh, the, uh, yes, a modest uh, leadership, but as Komrasa mentioned uh, the, uh, uh, in, in his statement, Japan is, a, is going to be a reliable partner for U.S. rebalancing to Asia. Yeah, I think this is a very uh, way, nice way of putting uh, in our role. You know, we are not going to be a sort of a, a subservient uh, partner, but uh, we are relying, going to be a reliable uh, you know, partner uh, in the uh, in implementation of U.S. policies. I think uh, the I think the U.S. needs one, and uh, the uh, Japan can be that one. And uh, I, I think that that is. Uh, Although in a very, very sort of modest way, but I think, uh, uh, as, as, as I recall uh, Komrasan's statement very uh, 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 clearly, this sentiment is shared not only by him, but also by Prime Minister Abe. So this is a very important political message. And uh, uh, whether the, the, the countries in the region will accept uh, the, uh, the Japanese leadership role, I, I, I'm not in a position to speak for them, you know, they, and, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, apart from uh, a, a country or two, I think uh, countries in the region are ready for seeing more increased uh, Japanese role in, in the maintenance of the security in the region. <coughs> now, uh, the, uh, uh, you mentioned India. The, uh, Japan-India dialogue, Japan-India cooperation, Japan-India, you know, the uh, uh, relationship is at its best. Uh, the, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, you know, the, there is a very close uh, relationship uh, uh, between uh, Prime Minister Abe and uh, Prime Minister Modi. But nonetheless, historically, uh, the Japan and India has been in, in uh, the, in, uh, in a very, very uh, close, uh, uh, good relationship. <clears throat> the, uh, and this good relationship is now very much strengthened by the uh, surrounding circumstances and, and also the close uh, relationship between the two leaders. Uh, I think uh, uh, Rich Amtich can testify the, how closely uh, Japan, India, and the United States work on a number of issues. Uh, so uh, uh, the, I, I don't know whether I should include a TPP as a sort of boost or difficulty. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> uh, as far as Japan is concerned, I think uh, the, uh, once the uh, uh, U.S. is ready for concluding the negotiation, I think uh, Japan it will be ready. Uh, the uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe sees TPP, if I, m this is my uh, suspicion, that I, 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 I think uh, Abe san sees the TPP very much from a security window. The, uh, I think he is ready to make a compromise on some of the difficult issues, in purely on, on sort of difficult issues in the agriculture sector, for instance. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, we do not have any difficulties uh, in other areas of negotiation, such as rules. Uh, the only difficulty remains in agriculture sector, but I think the, uh, I think, uh, the Prime Minister is ready to come up with uh, you know, the uh, deal on, this, on these aspects. So uh, it's, uh, if I may say, I think uh, the uh, successful conclusion of TPP very much depends upon what is going to happen here in Washington, D.C. And uh, then uh, uh, the, if uh, Japan-U.S. bilateral deal is reached, <coughs> the uh, I think uh, the, uh, the general negotiation on TPP would fall through. Uh, with one or two players may drop out, 
I don't know. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the key members of the, uh, the TPP negotiations uh, will be able to uh, go through this very difficult process. So it is going to be a difficult uh, project, but the, at the end of the day, this would be a very strong backdrop for the increased role of Japan-US cooperation. Uh, the, uh, so uh, the, that is the reason why I said it's a difficult task, you know, a difficult challenge for not only for uh, Japan, but also the, uh, uh, it, it, is a, it is opportunity. Uh, the, and also, this is a necess necessary backdrop for successful uh, uh, the U.S. rebalancing to Asia. And uh, <clears throat> that is uh, what uh, you know, Japan is uh, looking forward to, because uh, what is really <clears throat> needed is to uh, strengthen rule-based uh, you know, international trade uh, in, in Asia Pacific region, uh, the, uh, uh, the and, and also that works for strengthening the uh, much further the, uh, the U.S.-Japan security cooperation. So, uh, the the I don't know how you call uh, the antonym for double whammy. Uh, you know, the, uh, this works for two ways, and uh, you know, and the po positively, uh, you know, the. Uh, so these are the sort of points I, I just wanted to make at the outset, and uh, I do not go into the specifics of uh, the security arrangements and the you know, U.S.-Japan uh, guidelines, uh, because uh, Komura-san has already dis um, they amplified this, and uh, the Japan-China, I think uh, Takara-sensei talked about, uh, you know, uh, but nonetheless, uh, all in all, I think uh, uh, the uh, Yes, uh, I think Japan is in general ready for more strengthened uh, you know, U.S.-Japan uh, cooperation, and also the, uh, Japan is ready for uh, making good uh, the uh, what uh, Abe-san describes as a proactive contribution to peace. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, before I speak specifically about the topic. I uh, have to say a few things, I think, about my country, our country here. It's not a state secret that uh, our model right now is a little tarnished. The eagle's not flying as high as it should be, in my view. The model is seen in some quarters to lack efficiency, to lack energy. This is understandable when you see government, government shutdowns and gridlock here in Washington. It's insane. Totally insane. It's equally... Uh, the case that when our government uh, temporarily engages in national policy and torture, we tarnish our brand. We tarnish it seriously. So it seems to me it's about time uh, that, or when we uh, make statements about red lines in the Middle East, what we referred to in the earlier panel, and the red line becomes a pink line, becomes a white line, this hurts our brand. This hurts our brand a lot. The wisdom of doing something is a different matter. But having said something, I think the United States has to do it. This will not always be the case, in my view. We're getting our confidence back to some extent. Uh, someday we may even get some bipartisanship on Capitol Hill. But it is the case, and I hope President Obama will understand it, that we are a nation who has interest in every part of the globe, and nothing really meaningful can take place in any part of the globe without our active participation. Now, whether we're talking about Asia or the Middle East, et cetera. Now, the direct question that I was asked had to do with uh, are we better to, able together as an alliance to deal with uh, some of the scenarios that Dr. Takihara and, and uh, Ms. Hicks uh, spoke about earlier. Uh, the answer is mixed. Uh, to some extent, we're a little better off, but we're nowhere near where we should be. That's about to right itself. Now, a lot of credit, in my view, by me, had been given to Mr. Abe uh, for the decisions he's made in the first 700 days or so of his administration, and I mean every word of them. But part of the changed attitude in Japan about defense issues precedes Mr. Abe. I think they started practically in 2010 when that uh, fishing boat in China rammed the Coast Guard uh, cutter uh, of Japan. This woke people up. 
And then when the to Tohoku disaster hit, and the people of Japan saw what the JITI could do, saw what the U.S. military together with the JIT, uh, JITI could do, this further, I think, increased uh, some affection in the minds of many in Japan uh, for this alliance. And third, China. China has awakened, I think, the people of Japan to the fact that they need to do more in their own defense. And hence, Mr. Abe, I think, has taken very good advantage of that. He's advanced his um, decisions on uh, the cabinet decisions on collective self-defense, and I think we're, we're a lot better off. But let me go back to the Tohoku disaster, first of all, because we both haven't done what we needed to do. On the one hand, we worked together quite well. But one of the lessons learned with our U.S. Forces Japan headquarters was not ready for a big issue. We had to surge people to man that headquarters. We're still not ready. It's not operational, and it should be made more operational. One of the things, we were able to communicate together. We spoke the same language when it came to an emergency, but we couldn't do it in a secure fashion. We still can't do it today. We can communicate, but not in secure fashion. One of the things we did beautifully together was the reopening of the Sendai Airport. This was a fantastic military and humanitarian affairs disaster relief operation, which was seamlessly and flawlessly done. That's a very good thing. So there's a good basis, I think, in, in the tragedy that befell Japan to see where we can and have moved out a little bit, but we still have shortfalls. I'll give you another. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Kato will probably know exactly. There have been, this year, in Japan, about 980 intercepts. The highest number of intercepts ever. Japan was 1985, and I think there were 985. This fiscal year in Japan, I believe you're going to beat that record. It'll be a new record for intercepting uh, host uh, foreign aircraft in uh, your airspace. The United States is undergoing an F-15 upgrade for air defense capabilities. Japan is not. Are we going to wait till the F-35s come? Good luck. We need to be making these decisions now. Well, Ralph very correctly mentioned the terrible tragedy, the murder of the two Japanese citizens at the hands of ISIS. But what has been done to develop a special operations capability that would give Japan's leadership a, an ability to rescue Japanese citizens if it became necessary? If two, 20, or 200 Japanese were taken by ISIS, what are you going to do about it? I can do anything about it under present circumstances. Now, I referred to the cabinet decision on collective self-defense. This uh, obviously allows for um, UN PKO support and support for other militaries working PKOs. It allows for Persian Gulf minesweeping, assuming the legislation goes through, uh, the, the various pieces of legislation that are necessary to put this into effect. It will allow us to finish the guidelines on defense cooperation uh, for more joint contingency planning, for intelligence sharing, and for a more robust division of actual roles and missions between the United States and Japan. It also would provide for surveillance, uh, maritime uh, patrols, and a more integrated air defense. All these things would be possible. But there are still real shortfalls in logistics, in training, in interoperability between services in Japan and between the United States and Japan. Our U.S. Navy and the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force are pretty damn good at interoperability. Our air forces are not, and our ground forces are not. This is a shortfall we can't allow to have exist much longer. The cabinet decision on collective self-defense will also allow for more realistic uh, uh, decision making. For instance, uh, before we had the cabinet decision, how could you differentiate between a threat that was coming to Tokyo and one that was just directed against U.S. forces? You can't read a missile to that fine degree. This clears up that ambiguity. This allows us, the biggest single thing that the cabinet decision will do, will allow the United States to have very frank uh, and open discussions with, with Japan, and Japan likewise to have those same open and frank discussions without us getting wrapped up in our legal underwear over each and every issue, wondering whether it would be allowed, is it politically supportable? This is what's inhibited us for years. <clears throat> now, in addition to providing for real collaboration and interaction uh, through the cabinet decision, Mr. Abe has 
for three years in a row, uh, decided to put more money into the defense budget. That's terrific. Let's take a deep breath and see where we really are. Japan is the seventh largest defense budget in, in the globe. That's a good thing. But if you look at defense as a percentage of GDP, Japan is 102nd in the world, following Belgium and right before New Zealand. So there's plenty of room for more robust decision making. And both of our procurement systems are really in trouble. Uh, Mac Thornberry, one of our distinguished members of Congress, is really trying to reform our procurement, uh, uh, defense procurement system, and, and so too, I think, does Japan need the same to avoid the waste, to make sure that the money that Mr. Abe and his colleagues put to defense goes to defense, and it's not wasted. Now, a couple of, Ralph, you challenged us to talk a little bit about some of the uh, larger issue. The Middle East. As far as I'm concerned, what we're seeing in the Middle East is the aftershocks of the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, a hundred years after that dissolution. And it'll probably be, if we're lucky, ten years before you see a new Middle East. Note I didn't say a better Middle East. I just said a new Middle East. Having said all that, ISIS for the United States and for Japan is troublesome, vicious, but they're not existential, it's not an existential threat to us. And the difficulty the United States is having to deal with ISIS, in coming to grips with ISIS, is that it's a movement. It's not a military. So you can't fight it in a traditional military way. You can't apply the same metrics to it that you'd apply to a force-on-force -force battle. It's a movement. And it's a tough thing for us to fight. Now, but we do have an existential threat and it's not necessarily China. China is a question. China has good capability, which we both know about. It's increasing that capability, but her intentions are unknown. And it takes the combination of the two, capability and intention, to make a real threat. So I'm not prepared to say that China is yet a threat to the United States. Her behavior, particularly in the Senkakus, has been threatening to Japan and, and, and worrisome to all of us, but Russia, could present itself with an existential threat because unlike the previous panel's description of China, as I think Mike Green's description of a rising China, this is a declining Russia. And I think that means it's dangerous. They don't have, in, in the words of Dr. Joe Nye, as much skin in the game as a rising power has. So hence, they may be more dangerous to our interest. I think that's quite possible. Uh, two uh, sort of disconnected or un un unconnected uh, issues. One, uh, the energy uh, security. We've, and Dr. Hicks, I think, made it clear that we're not, no one is really energy independent. Um, but we've been blessed with uh, shale oil uh, recently. We are moving to being much more uh, self-reliant. Uh, and this does give us, if our government can make the decision, the ability to not just do our traditional defense of sea lanes, which then provides safety for the petroleum moving uh, or the natural gas moving to our various friends and allies, but if we export our product from the lower 48, and there is a discussion of this this year, next year, uh, this can provide real security to Taiwan, to Japan, to Korea, frankly to China, at a somewhat cheaper gas price, certain probably $4 a ton. And finally, a comment someone mentioned earlier, the Internet. And Ten years ago, I'm sure I would have been, if I were sitting here, I wouldn't pretend to really understand the Internet, but I would have said things that many have said, such as, oh, this is going to be great, it's going to really bring us together as a world, and it's really going to make uh, communications, and everybody will understand each other, and it'll be really kumbaya. The fact of the matter is, the Internet has been the single most divisive thing for societies around the world where you can spew hate and discontent anonymously and spread rumors, falsehoods, et cetera, anonymously, immediately to very wide audiences. So the, this is another threat, frankly, that I don't think that Japan and the United States have thought about together. So the mark I give to U.S. and Japan's ability to meet different scenarios is probably a C to a C plus. Now, there's one, however, thing that few of you will know about, but it's unclassified, and it can show you where we're going and how we're trying to overcome these shortfalls. We've just finished a bilateral exercise with Japan on the West Coast. 
It's actually two exercises. One was called Iron Fist, and the other was called Dawn Blitz. Iron Fist had about 270 uh, ground self-defense force members and uh, about uh, 570 U.S. Marines going ashore. Camp Pendleton, San Clemente, some people working out of 29 Palms in, in California. And it was a live firing exercise. And what was the purpose of this exercise? And it involved snipers, anti-tank helicopters that Japan brought, brought with them to the West Coast. It had uh, maritime self-defense force ships off of our coast. The stated purpose of this exercise, CPX live firing, sniping, heavy mortars, joint targeting, and island recapturing. Island recapturing. So I think we're getting serious about defense. Thank you, Ralph. Rich, thank you very much. The first and simplest task of a moderator is to introduce the speakers, which I, of course, fail to do at the onset, in part because I think everyone knows our speakers. I should at least mention that uh, Ambassador Nogami, former uh, Japanese ambassador to the UK, has run JIIA since 2009 in both good times and not so good times, but I think we're back in the good times area and has also for the past six or seven years been the co-host of, of this dialogue. Rich Armitage is Rich Armitage. Enough said. If, if you don't know Rich, then you're not only in the wrong room, in the wrong building, Baltimore is somewhere in that direction, you're clearly in the wrong city. So we're delighted to have you both. I do want to get to our, our audience's questions, but I want to just throw one question that I had mentioned in the beginning out. Uh, and that's the one that was raised at the uh, earlier session about what should we be doing, what can we be doing to make a stronger show uh, of resolve in the South China Sea. Uh, Rich, if you'd like to start. I, I think when we look at the activities of China in the South China Sea, uh, we generally come to a conclusion which I think is wrong, and that is that their actions have been counterproductive that they're actually driving nations in Southeast Asia towards the United States. That's somewhat true. Uh, and they're certainly uh, bringing about uh, what we would consider something that's not a good deal, and that is a, sort of an arms race. And certainly, uh, as some people described it, uh, they brought forward the concept of defense bling of uh, submarines, uh, which is the new defense bling, whether Australia gets their six or Indonesia gets new ones, et cetera. From, our point of view as we look at China, I think that's counterproductive. I don't think they think so. The answer, I think Dr. Takahara was asked, uh, do they calculate this? I think you said you don't know. I don't know either, but I think so. I think they do. They do. So my, my own view is that we ought to continue the most important thing we can. The very most important is just to something I think that Ambassador Nagami was talking about. It's TPP. Let's put us squarely on record as being completely involved in the life of Asia, Asia, with everyone playing with the same rules. And by doing so, show China as an outlier, show her as a model that is losing steam, not our model losing steam. So I think that's probably the single most effective thing. There are one-offs in each nation, and we're doing it with Vietnam, with the sales of certain maritime equipment. We're doing it in, in, in Singapore, perhaps in Malaysia. Uh, but n none of those individual issues are, I think, as large or loom as large as TPP. Well, this, uh, uh, this response is, uh, you know, sounds a bit uh, conventional, but uh, I, looking at and talking to the, uh, the uh, literal countries, uh, their capacity in, in terms of uh, maritime domain awareness is extremely low. So I think uh, the, uh, the pr provision of, uh, you know, patrol boats, training, and those things, uh, you know, the minimum, you know, what uh, Japan, uh, U.S., or Australia can do. Uh, the, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the uh, countries like uh, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and Indonesia, the capacity is extremely low. And uh, the first thing first, the capacity has to be slightly upgraded. 
Thank you. Uh, one last comment from me, and then I want to open it up for questions. Uh, and this is a, a shameless commercial. Uh, you heard a young fellow earlier identify himself as an SPF fellow at the Pacific Forum. Uh, we have a number of different fellowships, including the SPF fellowship that brings young people to Hawaii from both Japan and from the, the U.S. Uh, to study about the U.S. alliance and to work on various uh, aspects of it. So if you're interested in that, uh, Hawaii is not a bad place to be studying Japan from. Uh, and check out our, our website, www.pacforum.org, or see me or Jim, wave your hand once more, and uh, Jim will be happy to tell you more uh, about it as well. So let's open up the, the floor for questions, comments. Uh, I would ask you to try not to make your question longer than their presentations, uh, and we'll uh, sort of go from there. Uh, I saw one hand in the back. Yes, please. So, um, well, good afternoon. So, my name is, is um, I'm Matthew Kasturis. Um, I'm a sophomore at the George Washington uh, Naval Reserve Officer. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a training corps. I'm sorry. I just, I'm, I'm very nervous. This was a, a great panel. Thank you. Um, but my question is to Mr. Armitage. Um, thank you for your, your, I, for your awesome speech. Um, you really hit on a, a, a lot of great points. But I want to talk about the um, a nuclear grid for um, the Japanese, given the recent surge in public discontent towards nuclear power, as, I'm a, uh, as I want to enter like the nuclear navy after I am a, get my, uh, my ensign commissioning. But um, how do you see the future of, of nuclear power in a Japan that, that is requiring, that is um, um, using more and more fossil fuels? Excuse me. I certainly know, thank you, uh, how neuralgic the whole question after Fukushima of, of nuclear power is in Japan. Uh, but I don't see, in the short term, any way for Japan to be successful economically and to have the power they need as a nation without restarting a number, some number, of those nuclear facilities. And I think the uh, and we can talk all we want about alternative sources of energy and wind and solar and water and all of this, but the fact is it's all very expensive. So in the short to medium term, I think there's no uh, alternative but the starting of, of some of these reactors. I'm not competent enough to tell you how many. I don't think all 53 or so need to, but there's somebody who is competent is going to have to make that decision. Mr. Abe has spent a good bit of his uh, time explaining uh, his absolute desire to have these nuclear plants inspected, inspected, and inspected again, and be held to the highest standards so he can stand up in front of his people and say, this is safe, while we figure out what to do as an alternative energy source. Well, actually, uh, the uh, number of uh, the nuclear reactors uh, will be decommissioned. And uh, now the, uh, the schedule of uh, decommissioning is made uh, clear by the, the uh, utility companies. And, in, in, uh, and uh, then the uh, restarting, recommissioning, not decommissioning, recommissioning of uh, one or two will follow. And uh, at, but the uh, I think a recommissioning is based on a very, very uh, stringent application of this uh, safety regulations, and it, it's taking time. Uh, you know, the, uh, so uh, eventually, I think uh, government is uh, thinking about uh, about 20 percent of uh, uh, energy requirement. You know, that the 20 uh, percent of uh, new, uh, electricity in the uh, requirement will be from a nuclear as a sort of base source. But, the, uh, but nonetheless, I think it will be years before we come to this uh, level. Uh, because I think more, more power plants will be de 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 decommissioned than the, uh, the number of uh, new, the power plants which will be recommissioned. So overall, the size is going to decrease. Uh, 
thank you. Um, my name is Jamie Asif. I'm a non-resident fellow um, with the Honda Fellowship at Pacific Forum, and I'm a science policy fellow at DOD. And I have a question about ma using the alliance as a tool to manage non-traditional emerging threats in the region. So as Dr. Hicks pointed out, with globalization, increasing economic development in Asia, um, we have new technological um, concerns that we need to think about. So for example, uh, the spread of biotechnology in, in a Asia and Southeast Asia is a huge driver for technological, uh, for economic growth, but also uh, spreads dual use technologies. Likewise, um, growing interest in nuclear power um, in, in Southeast Asia, that's also going to create dual use technologies. We have um, growth of trans transshipment hubs in the region, not only in um, Singapore, but other, uh, other countries that are economically developing. And if you look at that together, that is um, that is a recipe that's ripe for um, proliferating dual-use materials that could pose WMD threats. And so my question is, how can we? Can do you think that we can use the alliance as a vehicle to marshal the resources that the U.S. government and Japanese government have, and the private sector have, um, to sort of manage those threats that we that the current tools we have aren't really well equipped to do, and and by extension, can we use the alliance to bring in the rest of the region to build capacity and get everyone working together to counter it? Thank you. Yes. I think uh, one of the uh, participants uh, the, uh, the, uh, from Japan, uh, the, uh, who is a specialist on the uh, non-proliferation, is here, and uh, part of our, our team. So I think I will ask uh, Akiyama-san to respond. You know, the, uh, uh, yeah. No, but why don't you stand up and make a comment right here? Uh, sorry to uh, intervene. My name is Nova Akiyama from Hitotsubashi University. And uh, uh, with regard to the uh, export controls, uh, I think gradually it becomes even more difficult because of uh, the uh, sort of spread of uh, use of uh, dual use items, as you know. And then uh, I think the, uh, as the economic growth, uh, I mean, an Asian country in general, economic growth, naturally, it's hard to sort of control the flow of uh, technologies. And also, the use of uh, nuclear energy, the greed, uh, sort of greed for the nuclear energy is increasing in Asia. And then uh, I think that makes it even more difficult for the technology holders like Japan, United States to control. And then uh, they also, for me, the concern is to what extent the will and the capacity of the, the administrators of these countries uh, you know, good enough to sort of, uh, you know, introduce the uh, stringent export controls and, uh, uh, you know, their non-proliferation mechanisms at home. So, uh, so like, you know, Japan, Australia, and the United States, these are the countries which must cooperate to introduce sort of a culture of non-proliferation culture of nuclear security so that the, uh, the develop, uh, countries in Asia spontaneously, you know, introduce stringent export controls. Do you think it's, an, it's okay? Thank, no, thank you, Nova. I, I would also uh, take this opportunity to brag a little bit that uh, at the governmental level, of course, the, the ARF, the ASEAN Regional Forum, has a non-proliferation and disarmament study group that has been looking at this. But at the track two level, I think leading the way, uh, JIIA and Pacific Forum as the U.S. CSCAP and Japan CSCAP have, have worked uh, moving this forward. We've also been doing a lot in the area of export control, uh, and we are now conducting training courses on both export control and non-proliferation in general uh, in Myanmar. Uh, we're also doing uh, activities like this in Taipei uh, and bringing Taiwan into the picture with the other countries in, uh, in East Asia. So I think there's a lot that is going on at the track two level, and we see behind the scenes, I think, a lot of very good close cooperation between Japan and the United States, both within the ARF and within uh, CSCAP to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, Chris, next question. Uh, thanks. Chris Nelson, exceeding my quota of three questions in one conference. I apologize. Uh, first, I wanted you to know, Sack and I volunteer to come out to Hawaii anytime you want us. We'll be there. 
Uh, oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I would like to re-ask the question I asked uh, uh, Dr. Hicks uh, to Nagami-san and to Rich-san, because I thought for all of the, of the general brilliance of her, of her overall approach, her answer on North Korea really missed the point of the question. Uh, sure, there's always a mix of sanctions and everything else, but the point is we're not doing it. And it's been clear, as Mike Green, I think, would attest, for the last 20 years, there is no uh, system of sanctions that the Chinese are prepared to support that would really pressure uh, behavior change in North Korea. So we're stuck with a situation where they keep on producing, we're not negotiating a cap, and yet now they're doing this economic uh, program, which if successful will make them even more successful, de facto nuclear power. Is my analysis too facile? Uh, is there a better way to think about this? Is there some way the U.S. and Japan can do a better job of getting our Chinese friends to see what we see, which is that North Korean nukes and missiles are a greater stability risk to Asia than uh, the pressure uh, uh, of, of regime collapse uh, through sanctions that aren't going to be enforced anyway? Is there another way to be thinking about this? Right. Uh, essentially, do we have some fresh thoughts on how to deal with North Korea? Uh, yeah, Rich, why don't you start and then... Uh, well, I, I take the position, first of all, that uh, we're not the only horse in this race, Chris. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, the Republic of Korea has the lead, and she has the most, the largest equities immediately at risk. And uh, I think uh, if, uh, over time, the Republic of Korea felt that things had changed to warrant a different approach, we'd certainly do it. At least I would be willing to, to, to do it. Second, on the on U.S. and Japan, I think there is, while we generally share the same view on China, I think on Korea, we view a threat from North Korea uh, more seriously than some in Japan do, because it's, it's always been there. It's been there so long. Uh, it's a known factor. Uh, when I just parenthetically, my comments about uh, the, the collective self-defense, one of the things that we are going to be able to do, again, without getting wrapped up in our legal underwear, is talk, frankly, with our Japanese friends about what sort of facilities, uh, rear area access, et cetera, we'd need if there were a contingency, a Korean contingency. We have never really spelled that out, and it would be something that has to be done on the fly, which is not a good thing to do in an emergency situation. I think it's a long way of saying that a couple of things can happen. Uh, they, the North Koreans, as you indicated in your previous question, are making some changes. Whether they're beneficial to a sufficient number of, of the citizens or not, I don't know. Whether it's sufficient enough to give North Korea the confidence to step forward, I doubt it, frankly. Because I see in, in Kim Jong-un, in addition to a, a rather outlandish haircut, I see a fellow who has no confidence. None. Notwithstanding, if you may have confidence to open up a little bit in the, in the agricultural sector or something like that, but he's a fellow who has to put in relatives or in-laws in every key position because he doesn't trust anybody. So I don't think this is a guy that I personally would be wanting to look for a brand new road today by myself. I would uh, be talking to our Japanese friends, but particularly to our Korean friends. On the question of how much influence China has, I don't doubt at all that attitudes in China have changed a lot toward North Korea. That I get it whenever we talk with Chinese friends. They're fed up, they're tired of it, it's an annoyance, et cetera. But whether that translates into policy change, certainly not yet. The, uh, as you know, the uh, Japan is uh, engaged in this uh, bilateral talks uh, uh, with North Korea <clears throat> over the uh, over some you know, some information about hostages and the uh, <coughs> the Japanese uh, uh, women who went back to North Korea years ago uh, and also those who have uh, the, the, uh, the deceased in North Korea and uh, we are seeking information on all, all the details of information on, on those issues, but nonetheless, so far we have not received any credible response. And as a result, the uh, Japanese, we have, uh, we have imposed sanction 
on top of the, uh, you know, the uh, UN and other sanctions. You know, we have a unilateral, uh, bilateral sanction. I mean, it, our own sanction, but nonetheless, uh, there isn't a very much a move on the part of North Korea. So I'm not really aware that you know this uh, sanction uh, route uh, is really a sort of effective way. But one thing I'm worried about is uh, the at the time of the collapse of the regime, who will go into North Korea? At the moment, nobody wants to. I think uh, this is a very dangerous situation. The uh, China may not. Uh, ROK definitely not, and the Japan, no, no way. And uh, who is going to go to North Korea to have uh, some sort of uh, semblance of uh, stability? Uh, that scenario uh, uh, has to be carefully and also you know, seriously considered because uh, uh, the regime may melt down. Uh, the, the, the leader is not very, very popular at all amongst North Koreans. Of course, you know, the Takarasa, Takarasa mentioned that the economic situation is slightly improving, but only those who are connected. The, uh, you know, the, uh, that's uh, <coughs> sort of very small version of the crony capitalism. But uh, the, uh, uh, the overall situation, I think, uh, uh, many in the North Korean government do not want to be seen by the leader so that uh, they are not exposed to any sort of uh, impossible task or danger. So it's uh, collapse, you know, it's, it, it, it's in a very precarious situation. Uh, the, so uh, the nuclear, yes, uh, but, but, but at the same time, we have, to, we have to think about the sort of meltdown scenario. Thank you. Thank you. If I could add just a quick point or, or two on, on the question. I, first of all, uh, what I found in our dialogues with the Chinese, a great more willingness uh, to discuss how the two of us can cooperate to deter North Korea from conducting additional missile and nuclear tests. Uh, based, I think, on the realization among the Chinese that our response to North Korean nuclear tests, our being the U.S., Japan, South Korea actually do not serve China's interests. So it's not because they've suddenly become uh, eager to cooperate with us, but understand that we need to take joint action to deter a future test. So in that area, I think there is opportunity for greater cooperation. The North Koreans say they want both nukes and economic development. Uh, the Chinese join us and the Japanese and Koreans in saying you can't have both. So all of us are saying the right words, uh, but many still believe that Chinese actions are allowing them to have both. Uh, and the question is, how do you get to get Chinese actions to match Chinese words? On, on the one, one point about the, the nature of the nuclear threat, uh, we conducted a, a trilateral tabletop exercise, a US, Japan, Korea exercise in Maui last fall and the re or last summer. Uh, the results are again on our, on our website. Uh, and what I found very interesting was that by and large, Japanese participants were much more concerned about the probability of North Korea using nuclear weapons against Japan than South Koreans were worried about them using it against the ROK. And where that plays out is I think a reminder from our Japanese colleagues that while there may be some UNC bases that are earmarked for supporting Japan, in the event of a conflict on the peninsula, Japan has some very high equities at stake and needs to be involved as an active player in making the decision on how to, how to move forward. Uh, ben, I had you next, and then other questions? Yeah, and then. Thank you very much. Yeah. This is another wonderful panel. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, as uh, Komura-sensei pointed out this morning, Japan has gotten much more serious about defense and the alliance. And as Armitage-sensei pointed out just now, there is real meat there in terms of the exercises that they're getting more serious. The alliance itself is getting much more serious about deterrence. We assume that the guidelines review will lead to an alliance that is really much more serious about maintaining the deterrence that's so critical to Asia. So we can all applaud that. 
At the same time, I'm reminded by Jim Foster's excellent question at the end of the last session that we also need a long-term solution for the East Asian region that's more than just balance of power deterrence. We need some form of security community building. And this leads me to something I think I read from Takahata Sensei as he described the challenge of security building with China, building a security community that includes China will likely involve or require some fundamental political change on the part of the Chinese before we can achieve that. Do you agree that that is necessary before we can achieve a security community, including China? That's my brief question. Essentially, there is fundamental change required in China before we can realize the goal of a Asia security community. Can, can you create that community with China as it is today? I suspect that eventually there will be change in China. But for a fundamental, no. We, we have existed quite well alongside systems that were quite anti-democratic. That's what you're talking about, a democratic opening, I think. Not, now, do I think there will be some moves to that direction? Yeah, over time. But right now, in my view, you have a China which also uh, lacks a certain amount of confidence, uh, else they wouldn't be putting so much money into the People's Armed Police. Uh, or their citizens might be more content to stay at home and try and, rather than trying to immigrate to Australia, the U.S., Canada, et cetera. So, uh, it's not absolutely necessary. We can coexist and have. Uh, but I think over time, the people of China are going to demand some degree of openness. They already are. Well, I don't, I, I don't think that China seriously believes in the uh, threat from Japan. The, uh, they, they, I think they talk about it. They, they educate the you know, kids uh, on, on these things and all these, uh, but I don't, I, I think that they are, the only security concern they have is the United States. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so if the uh, United States, uh, as uh, which says, can live with it, well, that, that, that's fine. I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the China talking about Japanese militaristic uh, you know, approach or, you know, the, the uh, returning to the you know, right-leaning, uh, you know, uh, government and all that, all that, that is, I, well, that is first a propaganda and second, that is for domestic purpose. And uh, three, perhaps uh, trying to use that as a card for some sort of, uh, you know, the uh, deal with, uh, with Japan. But nonetheless, I don't think they're uh, seriously threatened. We're running toward the end of time. I have at least two hands up. Uh, I want to take both questions, uh, and then if there's a third short question out there, I'll take it, and then we'll come back to the panelists. So, Kamea All right. All right. Uh, Matate Kamiya from Japan's National Defense Academy, and I have a question to Mr. Armitage. That is, uh, how do you perceive the limited nature of Japan's proposed exercise of collective self-defense? I think it is remarkable, and I'm very glad that Japan finally has decided to start exercising the right of collective self-defense. But as Mr. Komla said, the proposed way of exercising that right by Japan will be quite strictly limited. And do you think the way Japan will uh, or is scheduled to exercise that right <coughs> is sufficient for the U.S.-Japan security cooperation, which you believe necessary for the future peace and security in the Asia-Pacific region and globally? Uh, thank you. Uh, again, Jim Platy, I'm an SPF fellow. As Ralph said, I'd be glad to talk about the fellowship with anyone. Um, just quick question to Nogami-san about Japan-Russia relations. Um, in 2013, Abe seemed to have a good visit to Russia, uh, but obviously with the crisis in Ukraine since then, the relations seem to have stalled. Uh, just, I'd like to hear your thoughts on where you see Japan-Russia relations going now. Thank you. So why don't, we'll start with Nogami-san. Uh, if you would just talk a little bit about Japan-Russia and any final comments you want to make. And then, Rich, is limited collective self-defense enough? 
uh, and any other points you want to make, please. Well, of course, uh, you know, Japan has this uh, pending uh, issue of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, making a you know, peace treaty uh, upon solution of this uh, territorial, you know, the issues. On the, uh, I think uh, uh, that was one of the uh, political objectives, uh, you know, placed by uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, so he tried very hard to nurture the relationship with, uh, you know, Russia and also with the uh, relationship uh, with uh, the Putin. But uh, look uh, what he did, and uh, uh, Abe san had to say that he will not be able to condone any change of status quo by force. Uh, you know, that is a very clear statement. And uh, of course, uh, what he had in mind may be uh, not only in Russia, but also China. So, uh, uh, but on the basis of that statement, it would be extremely difficult as if to pretend you know, to behave as if nothing happened. So, uh, inevitably, uh, the uh, I think uh, the Japanese relationship uh, with Russia uh, is uh, is is very much stifled by what the Russia has done and what. The, the leadership uh, in Russia has been talking about, you know, use of nuclear weapon, and uh, you know, the, uh, all these uh, things. Uh, the I, I don't think uh, you know the uh, uh, Japan-Russia relationship will become sort of uh, normalized or the stabilized. You know, not not so soon. The, the contingent upon what uh, Russia is going to do vis-a-vis. Uh, Crimea or Ukraine, eastern part of Ukraine, or what the, he's, they are going to talk about the world order. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be an uh, easy one. Now, is this the first step or the only step? No, I, as I said, the government is taking, uh, as I said in my uh, you know, opening remarks, government is taking a cautious and incremental approach and that is wise. Uh, the, uh, oh, the, and also, mind you, the, uh, as Komarasan said it, there still is some anxiety uh, amongst the population. And uh, over time, this may be overcome, but uh, uh, there still is. I think uh, come uh, May, media campaign against it is going to be very, very noisy. Uh, but, but <clears throat> One thing, the, yes, uh, they came up with this conditions, you know, with the, the situation where Japanese are fundamental, you know, blah, blah, blah. In view of geographical distance, at the cost of, uh, you know, the, uh, at the cost of introducing those uh, qualitative uh, restrictions, the geographical restriction, uh, rest, restrictions uh, removed. I don't know which is more effective or not, but uh, after all, what is introduced as a new sort of uh, constraint is very qualitative. Uh, the, uh, but the, the geographical constraint we had upon, uh, on, on the basis of this old law is very, very sort of, geographical restriction is there. You know, it's very clear cut, but nonetheless, it's now a qualitative, and how you interpret this qualitative restriction will depend upon the future situation. So I think uh, that, that approach taken by the government, I think, uh, is rather clever. Joe Nye and I have written uh, years ago that the Article 9 prohibition on collective self-defense was an impediment to alliance cooperation. Assuming uh, the proper uh, legislation uh, is uh, agreed upon as we move forward, that impediment to alliance cooperation is gone. That is, the alliance cooperation on defense of Japan, et cetera, and perhaps patrolling sea lanes and things of that nature. Is it what I would have wanted? No, I would have wanted more. But this is the system of government Japanese citizens have agreed to, and we have the same 
general system uh, of democracy, and that means compromise. So the compromise with Comey Party to get uh, where they are uh, was necessary. And frankly, it's allowing, I think, from my observation, I was last in Japan about a month ago, it's allowing the Japanese people to get a better understanding of just what this means and what are the limits that Mr. Abe himself is talking about. He hasn't got a great free hand. But hand in hand with that better understanding of the people of Japan about what is involved in collective self-defense and what is involved with being your own master of your own fate uh, as a nation, uh, I think has been uh, the awareness in Japan that no longer can Japanese citizens hide behind good works as sufficient to make them safe in the world. God knows the government of Japan for 70 years has been involved in tremendously good work. It hasn't made Japan necessarily safe. Uh, Witness the murder of, of the two journalists uh, not so long ago uh, by ISIS. So uh, is it sufficient? Yes, for now. Is it a um, first step? That's for the Japanese people to decide. Uh, they'll make these decisions moving forward. Let me ask Mike Green to come and replace me while I ask you to join me in thanking our two presenters. Don't go away. You're, you're the wrap-up speaker. So you, you can stay, Richard. Great. Thank you. Let's drink. <laughs> um, I just want to thank uh, our partners at JIIA, uh, Nogami-san, um, uh, thank Ralph and Jim for starting this uh, very important annual uh, conference on the Alliance and joining us today, <clears throat> and the staff at CSIS who helped us, and we have a reception in the back. Um, the day's proceedings will be available online at the CSIS website uh, eventually, not right away. And uh, Nogami-san and I, and I think Yuzuka-san from Yomiuri, are doing a, a small um, podcast interview right now, which you can also view on your personal mobile device on your way home if you like. <clears throat> and uh, with that, thank you. And please join us in the back for uh, reception. Oh, and uh, I, I just simply echo what the mic had, had to say. Thank you. Thank you.